Well, I hope that you guys had a good week. Uh, Chantal and I had a wonderful week away down in Uray, Colorado. Got to do our first snowshoeing ever. Uh, the weather cooperated. It was wonderful. Uh, but it's good to be back. Uh, I know I just prayed with the kids, but would you just bow your heads and hearts with me as we uh, enter into God's word this morning? Father God, we thank you um, that you, do, you have called us uh, as sons and daughters of God to represent the King. Just ask now, Lord, as we, as we continue to look at the church and, and what it's meant to be and, and how we're meant to play a role in it, just ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes um, to, to some things we may not expect, to some things that uh, might look difficult, might look um, like something we don't want to be a part of or involved in or, or, or responsibilities greater than we feel qualified for. But help us, Lord, instead to see them as privileges. Like Mephibosheth was called to David's table, we've been called by the King of Kings to, to dine at your table forever. Help us, Lord, to recognize that privilege, that responsibility comes with it, but it is, it is a great responsibility. As this song is saying, that we are, we are worthy and unworthy at the same time. Thank you, God, for making us worthy even in our unworthiness to represent you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this week in a follow-up to last week's sermon, sermon concerning our expectations of the church, we now ask the question, what does the church expect of us? Uh, and again, I, I have a lot of potential responses to this. There's a lot of things that I want to say. Uh, we could spend the day talking about how we all play a role in church culture. A pastor alone can't make a Sunday morning service welcoming and warm and approachable. A pastor alone cannot care for all of the spiritual needs at the church, we need each other. I would love to encourage you today to advocate for yourself. I could spend the whole day talking about that. I love that word in the church, and I think that's important. That we advocate for ourselves. If you have a need, share it with someone. Share it with myself or one of the elders or a trusted friend here at the church. Believe it or not, uh, pastors and elders are not mind readers. Uh, I think that's a, but I, I think that that can always be the expectation sometimes. But if you're struggling, if you need help, your church expects you, but also pleads with you to not carry that burden alone. Obviously, there are many, many things to potentially focus on this week, but let's just hone in on one. What does the church expect of you? The answer that I would propose to that question could be the answer to any of the questions that we're, we have and, and will pose in this series. Of what does your pastor expect? What does your church expect? What does Jesus Christ expect of us? My answer today that I want to focus on is that you recognize and embody who God created you to be. It's a focus on identity. Uh, we spoke of, of the church as a body last week. Your church expects you, whatever part you are, to be a functioning part. For every person in this book, the expectation that God has had for them was not that they would all be like Abraham. The expectation would be that they would trust God and embody that trust in everything that they did. Identity is such an important place to start. Uh, I believe that all that we do in life flows from what we believe about ourselves. Your church expects you, your church needs you to be the person God created you to be, to listen to who he tells you that you are, and to not get distracted by all the things that the world tries to sell you. So I have some questions this morning as we get started. Who tells you who you are? What voices do you allow to speak into your life? Who has the power to say things about who you are? Because if you ask me, and you don't have to, I'm just Nate Roshan, I think that what God has to say about you is the only thing that really matters about your identity. Henry Nouwen said that Christ came to announce to us an identity based on success, popularity, and power is a false identity, an illusion. Loudly and clearly, Jesus says, you are not what the world makes you. You are a child of God. And Nouwen famously identified in a if you ever have time, he's got a really wonderful sermon series on the beloved of God uh, you can find on YouTube. Uh, he identifies three lies from the world, three lies that the world says about our identity. And they are these, that you are what you do, you are what you have, and you are what other people say about you. We need to take a hard look at this list and understand that these three items are waging war against us. These things, if we allow them, seep into our lives. They 
they, they very much will, will tell us, they will direct us, they will control us. Uh, and I need you to understand this morning that, that someone else has laid a claim on who you are. The Bible says that you were created by God. That God was not distant when you were made, but actually intimately involved. We read the account of the formation of, of Adam and Eve in Genesis, right? That Adam was formed from dust and Eve from his rib. But scripture actually tells us that God was very intimately involved in your own formation. The Bible says that you were made in the Imago Dei, in the very image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over all the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all of the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. And the Bible says that the person sitting next to you, that they were made in the Imago Dei as well, not just good people like my wife that might act a little bit like God, right? Or, or handsome people like Jason or Matt that might <laughs> resemble God in stature. Or wise people like Chris or Sylvia that, that might tell us something of the wisdom of God. But even people like me, even I was made in the image and likeness of God. Scripture makes clear that being made in the Imago Dei makes human beings valuable in the sight of God. And that we ought to value other people as God does. Genesis 9, 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his own blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. That's his reasoning. That's God's reasoning for valuing human life, that we are made in his image. This tells us that God cares a great deal about his creation because he made us like him in some way. James 3, 9 and 10 says that with our tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we also curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. So we see that being made in the image and likeness of God seems to be very important, seems to carry some weight to it. But what does it mean? What does it mean? Have you ever thought about that? What it means to be made in the image and likeness of God? Well, there are three views on what the image and likeness may refer to. All right? The first view is, a, is called the substantive view. It's that we're like God in nature. And that we are, we kind of, we take up space. Uh, we physical and God spirit. That we are shaped in body and mind to be like God. That we are his offspring. And all of this expresses uh, more than just a casual link between God and man. In our substance, we are like God. The second view is the relational view, that we are like God and that we have a relationship with him and that we pursue relationships. Humanity knows of God and consciously relates to him. And the third view is the functional view, that like, we are like God in our work and in our deeds, that like God we act with intelligence, we make choices, we have dominion, and that we are meant to bring glory to God, which is also God's own purpose, Psalm 148. In this way, we are defined by our relationship with God. In substance, relationships, and functionality, we were made like God, unique among all of God's creation. Who are you? God's creation, made in his image and his likeness. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Weight of Glory, wrote that there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Who are you, then, is an important question. But whose are you is an eternal one. In the ancient world, when kings and queens ruled over a, a given area, various kingdom, they expressed their power in a the land they controlled by planting stones in the ground along the edges of their kingdom with carvings of themselves, glorious victories or important moments for their reign or, or just, you know, a portrait that they liked and thought looked nice. Uh, they called these stones that the kings and queens put in the ground stele. I don't like that pronunciation. I want to call it a stella or a, something like that, but it's pronounced stele, S-T-E-L-E. And these stele marked their territory and told everybody who saw them 
just whose territory they were entering, what king or queen was in charge, who ruled over the land. I have a stele to show you. This stele is from 2200 BC from Acadia, which is northern Mesopotamia. It depicts the Akkadian ruler Naram Sin, whose title was the king of the four corners, or literally the ruler of the world. You see him on top of the stele. He's kind of the one basically standing on top of everyone else there. Uh, he looks glorious. He looks powerful. He's standing on top of all of his defeated en enemies there. Um, and this would have shown everyone entering into the kingdom, this is Naram Sin's territory. He rules here. He reigns here. Don't you see how powerful he is? The God that I read about in Scripture did something similar, actually. But he didn't need to leave stone carvings of himself for people to find. He did one better. He made people. In his image, his own living steely. Now, I'm a lot of things. I'm a pastor. I'm a husband. I'm a brother. I'm a friend. Probably a lot of other things. I am a steely for the king of kings. I am a steely for the king of kings. It defines who I am. It tells me what I am to do. And it also tells me how important you are. It tells me that you are worth my time and my attention and my energy. It tells me that you are worth a night of my week to come and slow down with you and ask bigger questions of ourselves than we often do. Because if you are a follower of Christ, you are a steely for the king. If we are steely made in the image of God, then what we do matters. Because I don't just represent Nate Roshan anymore. Just like when I worked for Pepsi, I didn't just represent myself anymore. I had a brand to represent. That I was, whether I was having a good day or a bad day, it didn't matter. I was representing that brand. I don't get to choose on and off days as a Christian. I'm a steely for God. And when we lie or we steal or we cheat or we gossip or groan or grumble, when we look nothing like Jesus, there still is that association. That's still what hits the news. That's still what enters into the thoughts of people far from God. It was not just Nate Roshan who acted unbecomingly. It was a Christian, one representing the king. We will not be perfect in our representation. If you think you can, I encourage you to read Romans chapter 7 where Paul shares with us his struggles of trying to be the representation that he would like to be. But for today, let's turn to another of Paul's letters, his letter to the church in, Col in Colossae. The third chapter, uh, to read his encouragement there for a group of people who, much like us, are stumbling along on the way toward representing our God well in a world that desperately needs kindness and love and to see what forgiveness looks like. We'll look at <clears throat> verses 1 through 17 there, um, but we'll break them into, into several chunks. Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. This chapter begins with, with an obvious note of encouragement, right? The confidence that for the believer, Christ has already done the work. Christianity is not about a set of rules and principles. The way is not keeping the rules. The way is a person. The way is Jesus Christ. There's nothing left to achieve, nothing that can be earned. Our salvation is Jesus plus nothing else. My hope is in him, not in me. Praise the Lord. Paul mentions where Christ is, that he's seated at the right hand of God. And this communicates to us in a very real sense that for those who trust in Jesus, our citizen, we're, we're already citizens there with him. So think of, think of us, think of yourself as, as a citizen of heaven. We already belong to that world. So then as people already saved, think of Jesus, his will and his way. Do this by reading Christ's own words recorded for us in scripture. Don't think about the things of earth, the lies the world tries to tell you 
that you are what you do or that you are what you have or that you are what other people say about you. For you died, Paul writes. And we can be confident that our life is secure, is hidden with Christ and God. Paul continues with the implications of sin and he uses a pattern starting in verse 5 um, that, that is fairly common to Paul. Uh, he, he speaks of it in, this, in a very same, similar fashion in Ephesians chapter 4 of first taking something off, the old way of life, the dirty clothes that you used to live in and putting on something new. <clears throat> it's a pattern common to life. It's something we experience every day. We, we take off the old dirty clothes and we put on a new way, new clothes for a new way of life. First, Paul encourages us to take off some things. He writes, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. These are things all people are predisposed to. We are all predisposed to sin. This is our human nature. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. These things are, are not just mistakes. They're not just throwing in a bullseye and missing. These are, these are blatant sins, not just against one another. These are sins against God. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourselves of all of these things, of all of the, such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. He is our unity. There will be nothing else. Paul affirms that as Christians we are works in progress. A chapter earlier, Paul referred to laws that attempted to address behavior. In Colossians 2.21, he refers to laws of do not handle and do not taste and do not touch. These were man-made applications of a law that were futile to keep people like you and me from sinning. They were fingers in the dam trying to hold back the weight of sin. They did nothing to address our cravings and our obsessions, the root of the problem. So Paul strikes at the core of the problem in chapter 3. It's our desires. It's our sinful desires. You've got to be convinced, as the imago Dei, as the image of God, that greed will kill you. It will take you nowhere good. You've got to be convinced in your mind that the lust that you struggle with needs to be killed. Paul calls here for a complete extermination of the old way of life. But again, not just the old behaviors, but the old motives. And then verse 10, and, and here the words, Paul speaks of this new self being put on, having discarded the old dirty rags, the new self can be put on, renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. Renewed in the image, renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. That word renewed is another passive verb. We talked about passive verbs last week. This one is um, anuk, anu minon. <laughs> oh, my Greek's a little rusty. Uh, we talked about passive verbs last week. They're an action that happens to you and you receive. So this passage is saying that God's Spirit will renew you. It, it is something that God's Spirit will do to you and you receive. This verb is also a present verb, uh, which means ongoing action. So this is something, this renewal by God, being made more and more in His image, is something that is, is continual. Paul's not talking about a need to revamp or to do like a slight change. Uh, or as the commentator Edward Ed Schweitzer puts it, this is not giving up a few vices and accepting a few virtues. Instead, Paul's referring to a work of the Spirit where as a result we remember and believe that God made us in his image, that we are valuable in his eyes, and it's submission as well, submission to the work of the Spirit of God to be sanctified. Sanctified, that's a big word that gets thrown around in the church. What does it mean? Here's the best I've got, uh, and I hope this helps you as you think about, you know, so, sorry, let me break it down. A person comes to repentance. They understand that by their own, they cannot uh, 
say to themselves, we have sinned against God. My heart remains dirty, as, as Isaiah said, cried out, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. So we come to repentance, we turn to Christ as our Savior, and that is salvation. From that point on begins this process of sanctification. What does sanctification look like? How does that work? The best way I've heard it explained to me is that it's like marriage. On your wedding day, uh, you know, the priest, the minister turns to you and, and pronounces you man and wife. From one second to another, nothing has really changed. You don't suddenly become an amazing husband, but you are declared a husband. By the power of the state given to that priest, he has now declared you man and wife. Sanctification is living into that office for the rest of your life. You are not all of a sudden a great husband from one second to another. That is a process that you will carry with you your entire life, trying to live into that office of being that man, being that wife, being that Christian, that child of God. That is sanctification. Paul goes on. Colossians 3, 12 and 14. Therefore, having taken off this old way of life and beginning this process of sanctification, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves then, having removed all that junk, with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This taking off of the old selfish way of life and putting on of this new way is not a call to become less human. It's a call to become more. The perfect example of a human is not man in his error. The perfect example of, of humanity is Jesus Christ on the cross, made in the image and likeness of God. These traits and characteristics uh, exemplified in Christ is what God created us to be. It's a return to humanity. There are to be the garments that we wear. There are to be the things that we are identified for, identifiers and followers of Jesus. All of these wonderful actions are founded on God's own action. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Finally, Paul offers some incredibly practical ways that we should live in community, the heart of uh, what our churches expect of us. I think I lost my last page of notes, which is fine. Um, let me read from Colossians 3. In there. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body we are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What does the church expect of us? Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. That we be people that reflect on constantly, living in, living through this knowledge of God. Paul gives us a, a number of different examples, a number of different ways to let the peace of Christ rule in us. He mentions psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Reminds me a whole lot of the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where God commands his people, and that's a prayer that's still prayed among Jewish communities three times a day. That no matter what they're doing, no matter where they are, that they stop and they recall. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That we should love him with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our strength. And, and the command is to, to talk about God in every situation, whether we're laying down or getting up, whether we're walking along the road or we're sitting down in our homes. It's supposed to be our language. I'm, I've, I've always been a little shocked how, how easy it is to talk about so many other things. It's so easy uh, on a Sunday morning to talk about sports or hunting and fishing or the weather. Or all the... Speaking of God is what we were created to do, amplifying who he is reflecting on who he is, because you and I need to hear that from each other. 
I want to close uh, with a story, uh, I have to do it justice. Um, it's a story that really touched my heart in this last year. Um, in Istanbul, Turkey, there's a church called the Hagia Sophia. I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, there it is. It's now a mosque, which is kind of interesting. Um, but actually, before the Hagia Sophia was the Hagia Sophia, it was this incredible wonder of the world. Um, it was actually, there were actually several other churches that stood on the same ground. And I believe it was the first or the second. Uh, I've got, there's just a sketch of it that remains. That's the interior now. But this is just a, a sketch of the first. And at that time, it, it was one of the wonders of the world. People traveled all from all over would travel uh, to visit this church. I think it was the, the Church of Theodosius II, I believe. And people from all over the world would travel to come and see this church. Well, one day the, the, the emperor decided that he wanted to honor his wife by putting a statue of her right in the front of this church. And so the people, uh, the, the emperor went first to the bishop. The bishop refused and the emperor had him exiled to an island, never to be heard from again. The emperor went back to the church and said, no, no, you're not going to stop me. I'm going to do this, and construction is going to begin tomorrow. The people, the members of the church of Theodosius II, burned that church to the ground that night, and about a third of the city with it. The emperor made a miscalculation. The emperor thought it was about this building. The emperor thought it was about this beautiful place where we can gather and we can have community. He didn't realize that for them and for their heart, it wasn't about this building. It was about the God they were there to praise. I want that heart in me. To be speaking of God, to be, to be for, for this place to be about God. It's not just about what we can get. It's not just about fulfilling our spiritual quota. It's not just about, you know, attaining a feeling on a Sunday morning. It's about honoring the God that we build big structures to, that we glorify with our lives. And it's about encouraging others in that. What does the church expect of us? That we would embody, that we would recognize and embody who God created us to be. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you we thank you, Lord God, that you are, you are not primarily glorified by buildings and structures and, and trellis work. Lord God, you are, you are glorified on the, on the vine that grows on the trellis. Help us, Lord God, as we attempt to be good representatives of you. Attempt to be people that are known more for what we're for and the love that we have than what we are against as we are made humble by again remembering again and again and again that yes, you have declared us worthy. On our own, we are unworthy. Help us, Lord God, to, to never forget all that we have been forgiven of. I'm a man who's predisposed to everything. If, if there's a sin in the book, I've committed it, Lord God. You have saved me from my sin. Don't ever let me stop telling that to the nations. Don't ever let me stop having a compassionate heart because you, oh God, perfect in your goodness, perfect, holy God, you have forgiven me, a sinner. So Lord, let us, let me, let us recognize and embody who God, you are God our Father, who you have created us to be. We thank you and we praise you. We acknowledge you. We thank you for the love that you have for us and for those that are outside of these walls that as of yet do not know the Lord of love. Help us to represent you well. Help us to remember that we wear that Christian badge, that there are no days off. That is not a pressure, that is a privilege. Seated at your table, citizens of heaven, we now get to live as Christ lived we now get to embody the faith we claim to have. Let us take that seriously. Let us live earnestly. Give us eyes to see the people that don't know you. And instead of burning against them, 
would we, as, as is spoken of Christ so many times, more than any other phrase, any other description of Christ, your word says that Christ again and again was moved to compassion. So Lord, oh Lord God, would you move us to compassion for people that don't look anything like us, don't act anything like us, don't know our God, don't like our theology. Help us to be moved to compassion for them, embodying the faith we claim to have in you. Thank you, God. Thank you for this identity that we have not earned, but you have given us as sons and daughters of the King. In your name we pray.